church said I welcome everyone to our Bible study tonight in Jesus name for those who are coming for the first time it's going to be a memorable time in your life in Jesus name and for our pastors our leaders our workers our members who have been coming before I pray that the spirit will open your eyes of understanding and you see everything that belongs to you in the world in Jesus name the Lord will bless everyone tonight. Amen. Father, we thank you for our Bible study. Thank you for bringing us together. We thank you because you are a great God, a mighty God, a glorious one, a majestic one. And we're asking, O oh Lord, that tonight you open the pages of the scriptures to every heart in Jesus' name. Amen. We're asking, Lord, that you turn every life around. Amen. That there will be something that will happen of great, tremendous benefit in every heart, in every life, in every family, in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless the young and bless the old. Amen. The men and the women, the brothers and the sisters, the leaders and the workers and the members. Oh Lord, bless everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep us awake Amen. and awaken everything within us, spirit, soul and body, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let life in all areas come into everyone. Yeah. Eternal life, yeah. abundant life, yeah. spiritual life, yeah. a life that makes us really looking into the word of God and then being prepared for the coming of the Lord. Yeah. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. We're coming to John chapter 11. We've been studying the, the gospel according to St. John, and we have been studying from chapter 1. Now we come to the concluding verses of chapter 11. And in chapter 11, I'm looking at it from verse 39. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Master, the sister of him that was dead, says unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he had been dead four days. Jesus says unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, that thou shouldest see the glory of God? And he still said the same thing to every one of us today, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. That means, if you believe, thank God I believe. And as you believe, it says that faith in believing the Lord will lead to you seeing the glory of God. Verse 41, then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Understand? He had not even asked. He has not even prayed. He has not even made the request. But he knew that the Father will listen to him and will hear him. He always did the thing that pleased the Father. And the Father also will always respond to him in a pleasing way. And so before he prayed, before he made the decree, before he made the proclamation that Lazarus should come forth, he said, Father, I thank thee already. Because thou hast heard me. Look at verse 42. And I knew that thou hearest me. How often? Always. always. Every prayer of Jesus is always answered. And when he comes to live in your heart. And he reigns in your heart. And you give him the chance to reign without a rival in your life. The time will come when every prayer of yours will be answered in Jesus name. Verse 42, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, everybody, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, he had to come forth. Amen. The word of Christ must be fulfilled. Amen. And whatever it is, the stone that is rolled over the grave, and whatever it is in your life 
the word of Christ must be fulfilled. Tonight it will be fulfilled. This year before the year runs out, everything the Lord has promised you, and you have said, oh Lord, you promised me this, you promised me this, and you told me more and more at the beginning of the year. The year is coming to an end. The Lord is going to fulfill his word for you. And so the Bible says very clearly here that Lazarus actually came forth. He that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot, with back with a clothes, grip clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus says unto them, Lose him and let him go. Looks like God is talking about you tonight. Lose him and let him go. That was a great miracle. And you're going to find out that the miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ actually manifested forth his glory. His glory as the only begotten Son of the Father. The Lord Jesus Christ had been with the Father from all eternity, before the beginning of the world. He had glory with the Father, and the disciples beheld his glory. He did what no other man had ever done. As you look through the Bible, no man has ever done this that Jesus did. Actually, as you look at John, the Gospel according to St. John, the miracles they recorded were special miracles, spectacular miracles, supernatural miracles of things that no other person had done even before the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it will show you and to show me that Jesus Christ actually had glory. And those miracles manifested forth the glory of Christ. Look at chapter 1 of John. John chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. You see that from the very beginning of the gospel of John. He tells us that the reason why this is written is so that you will behold his glory. You'll see that glory tonight. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Look at chapter 2, verse 11. In chapter 2, verse 11, talking about the manifestation of the glory of Christ as he performed all those miracles. Chapter 2, verse 11, it says, This beginning of miracles did Jesus a Cana of Galilee and manifested forth, tell me, his glory and his disciples believed on him. You remember when we read chapter 11 of John at the beginning, when Jesus told them that Lazarus was sick, he told them the reason why he'll be going there. Chapter 11 of John, we're reading from verse 4. When Jesus had that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. That the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Lord, the Master, that he might be glorified thereby. And so you understand, whatever problem, whatever challenge, whatever crisis may be in your life today, God is going to have glory. He's going to solve that problem. It's going to heal that sickness. It's going to take that calamity away. That disaster will not continue in your life because you're going to see the glory of God. I will see the glory of God. Look at chapter 11, chapter 11, verse 40. It says in verse 40, Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Very simple. To see the glory of God, only believe. And as you believe, whatever it is you are brought here as a problem tonight, you believe in the Lord, glory. Somebody shout glory. The glory of Jesus will be manifest in your life in Jesus' name. And we're looking at John chapter 12. John chapter 12. And here I'm reading from verse 40. In John chapter 12 verse 40, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts that they should not see what their eyes. He's talking about the unbelievers, talking about the Pharisees, talking about the Sadducees, and understand not with their hearts and be converted that I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory. 
and speak of him. That is, uh, Jesus having glory is not a strange thing. In the Old Testament, Isaiah, when he saw the coming of Christ, the birth of Christ, the life of Christ, the ministry of Christ, the death and the resurrection of Christ, he looked ahead and he saw the glory, the glory that was to come of the Lord Jesus Christ. When did he have this glory? How long had he had that glory? Look at chapter 17, John chapter 17, verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory, look at this, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Before the beginning of the world, before the creation of the world, Jesus had been in heaven because he's eternal, the Son of God, eternal. And because of that, he had had that glory before any angel was created, before any man was created, Jesus had been. And he had this glory with God the Father in heaven. One of these days, you'll be in heaven and you'll see that glory. Look at verse 24. Verse 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. It's talking about the believers getting to heaven. It's talking about the believers. After you are saved, you continue with the Lord, and you are sanctified, you are made holy, because without holiness, no man shall save the Lord. When you remain like that in the grace of God, that brings salvation and teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly laws and to live soberly in this present world, and then you accept that experience of being redeemed from all iniquity, and you are purified, a peculiar person, unto the Lord. When you leave this world, you'll go to heaven. I'm talking to somebody there. I say, when you leave this world in holiness, you'll get to heaven in Jesus' name. And then he says, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. You see then that Jesus Christ had glory. And that glory manifested forth. And today as you come to Christ, and you look at Christ, and you behold Christ in your heart and in your life, you will see that it's going to manifest that glory in your life. It will transform your life. It will change your life. And you'll become like it's a radiant, a glorious life in Jesus' name. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all, how many of us there? We all. I said how many of us? Every child of God, if you are born again, every child of God, you have turned away from your sin and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, but we all, with, an, with open face, behold him as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. You see that? You're looking at Christ, you're learning from Christ, and you're beholding his life, and you're beholding his sinless life, his spotless life, his righteous life, and his life that was heavenly, and you're beholding that as in a glass. We are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You see what the Lord is saying there? He's saying that when you behold Him and you see Him, then you're looking at Him and looking at Him and you're walking like Him and you want the grace in His life to come into your life. He says that you are going to have glory and I pray it will happen in your life in Jesus' name. Tonight we are looking at this passage, the manifestation of Christ's glory. The manifestation of Christ's glory. The raising of Lazarus from the dead manifested forth his glory. And it led many to believe on him. The people that were there, and he knew that Lazarus had been dead for four days. In fact, was thinking by this time. And Jesus came with all power and authority. And then he gave the decree and the declaration. Lazarus come forth. And he saw Lazarus coming forth. And he said, lose him and let him go. And he released him and he came alive. Even the sickness that killed him, that sickness was totally healed. When they saw that, they saw his glory and it brought them to repentance. They saw his glory, it brought them to salvation. You know, today, if you will thoughtfully behold the glory of Christ, if you will think through as you see the work of Christ and the miracle of Christ, it will lead you to a definite decision for Christ. 
It will lead to your salvation. It will lead to your transformation. It will lead to your sanctification. It will lead to the rededication of your life unto the Lord. When you behold his glory and when you behold his majesty and you see the great work he has done, it will lead you to full, complete, entire, unwavering obedience to him as the Lord of glory. You see, there are many people, they have not thought about Jesus Christ as the Lord of glory. They just say, it's my Savior, it's more than that. They just say, it's my Lord, it's more than that. It's the very Lord of glory. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and see Jesus referred to as the Lord of glory. The Heavenly Father is the God of glory. And Jesus Christ is the Lord of glory, the King of glory. First Corinthians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 7. It says, from verse 7, it says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Look at verse 8, it says, Which none of the princes of this world knew, for at they known, had they known it, they would not have crucified, tell me, the Lord of glory. They crucified him because they were ignorant. They crucified him because they did not know. They did not know that he was the Lord of glory. And he's still the Lord of glory. And when he enters your life, when he comes to your life, he'll bring glory into your life. He'll bring majesty into your life. He'll bring honor into your life in Jesus' name. Christ is the Lord of glory. And the miracles he performed should forth, shine, shine forth the glory of the Lord. Is the Lord of glory. James chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 1. James chapter 2. We're looking at verse 1. It says, My brethren, have not the face of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. It says, you have faith in the Lord. Remember, it's the Lord of glory. There's not going to be any partiality in your life. You're going to live a life that brings glory to God because you're serving the Lord of glory. As I said, as we look at this passage in John chapter 11 today, the topic is the manifestation of Christ's glory. The manifestation of Christ's glory. We're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, the preparation. The preparation. You see, before that glory came, he gave them instruction. He gave them a commandment. He said, this is what you have to do. And you need to know that in your life, that a miracle is coming in your life. And the power is coming into your life. But you see, there's a preparation you're going to make. And so we are point number one, the preparation. Point number two, the persuasion. The persuasion. There were people there, and when they saw what had happened, they were fully persuaded. And because they were persuaded, that's why they went and they believed on him. Number three is the prophecy. The prophecy. Number one is, tell me, the preparation. What's the preparation? Take ye away the stone. He was going to get Lazarus out of that grave, but the people must prepare. And the preparation is take ye away the stone. Point number two. The persuasion. Trust absolutely in the Savior. Trust absolutely in the Savior. You are not trusting him partially. You are not trusting him half-heartedly. You are not trusting him without, you know, almost like you're sleeping and you're, you're slumbering. No, you are trusting him. You are believing in him. You are having confidence in him absolutely, completely. The persuasion, trust absolutely in the Savior. Point number three, the prophecy, truth announced for all sinners. Truth announced for all sinners. We're coming to number one now. And this is the preparation. Remember now that Jesus was about to manifest forth his glory. His glory in the life of Lazarus that was dead. 
His glory in the family of Mary and Martha who had lost their brother. His glory in Bethany, in that village, in that city where everybody was mourning because that was a popular, well-known family. He was going to manifest forth his glory near Jerusalem, just two miles to Jerusalem. He was going to manifest his glory on, in the land of Israel. But then uh, there must be a preparation. I believe you are getting prepared yourself. I said, I believe you are getting prepared yourself because it's going to manifest His glory in your life too and in your family, in your soul, in your spirit. But it's a preparation to make and it's a preparation of taking away the stone. Look at chapter 11, John chapter 11, reading from verse 39. John chapter 11, verse 39. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Master, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he had been dead four days. And they were told in verse 40, Jesus says unto her, Said not I unto thee, that thou wouldest, if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Master, just obey. Just obey is the way, God's way to a miracle. Just obey, just obey is the way, God's way to supernatural manifestation. Just obey, just obey. There's no other way but this, just obey. Didn't I tell you that if you will obey and if you believe, you'll see the glory of God. Look at verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. Thank God they obeyed. I said, thank God they obeyed. Thank God you are going to obey the Lord. Take care away the stone. What does that mean for you and for me? What's he telling us to take away? If you're going to see the manifestation of the glory of God, what are you going to take away? It tells us very clearly, as they were to take away the stone, there's something we are to take away. Look at this in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4. Jeremiah chapter 4, looking at verse 4, it says, circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskin of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. You see, uh, these people were sinners. They were Israelites, religious people, but they were living in sin. And the Lord said, there is something blocking the glory of God in your life. There's something that is blocking the majesty of God, the miracle of God, the power of God in your life. And it is this stiff neck. It is this rebellion. It is this disobedience. It is your transgression. And so take away the first king of your heart, ye men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Come to uh, Ezekiel chapter 11. Ezekiel chapter 11. And you see the prophet is saying the same thing. Take away the stone. There's something to take away. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 11 and verse 18. Ezekiel 11. What verse are you looking for there? Verse 18. And they shall come see that. Look at this. And shall. Look at this. And shall. And shall. Take away all the detestable things with thereof. And all the abominations thereof. From this, you see, that's a miracle happens. There are many people that are saying, I've never seen a miracle, I've never seen the sick healed, I've never seen the supernatural, I've never seen the glory. You are here tonight, you will see. But you know, there's a preparation to be made, and the preparation is to care away the stone. It says, All detestable things in your life, all things that God detests, He hates. He says, that should not be there. He says, take that away. And then God is going to do something. Look at verse, 20, verse 19. And I will, make, I will keep them one heart. And I will put a new spirit within you. Look at this one. And I will take the stony heart out of their flesh. And will give them a heart of flesh. That is, they will do the first part 
all the things that are defiling, all the things that are detestable, all the things that are abominable, they themselves, they'll take all that away. And then he says, I'll walk the miracle, I'll do something they cannot do. I will take the stony heart out of their flesh. I'll give them the heart of flesh. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36, and I'm reading from verse 25. There's a preparation to make for you to see the glory of God. You take away the stone. You take away all the detestable things. You take away all the transgressions. You take away all the abominations from your life. You turn away from them so that you can be cleansed, you can be washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Look at this in chapter 36 and verse 25. Then will I speak clear water upon you, and you shall be clean. Somebody there, you shall be clean. You know, the Lord can clean up your heart and clean up your soul, clean up your spirit, clean up your thoughts and clean up your past that you become totally new. You become a new creature in Christ. And when you become a new creature in Christ like that, get ready, get ready. Great glory is coming upon your life. It says, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness. How much of the filthiness is he going to take away? All. And from all your idols, how many idols will he take away? All your idols will I cleanse you. A new, a new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will... Say it aloud. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you an heart of flesh. You see, that's what God does. That's what God does. He takes away after you have done your part, you repent, you turn, and all those detestable things you have been harboring in your heart, in your mind, in your life, you take everything away, and then God will come in his own supernatural power and he'll take that thing away. You know, as the New Testament talks about it, it says it in a plain language you cannot miss. Look at First John, First John chapter 3, verse 5. First John chapter 3, we're reading from verse 5. It says, And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. You see what God wants to do when he prepares you. You see many people, uh, they, they go to an assembly, they go to a fellowship, they go to a church, they go to a denomination, but they do not understand. They say, I don't know why God is not blessing me. I don't know why God is not working miracle. I don't know why God is not fulfilling his promise. Because they didn't take away the stone. Because Jesus is interested in your life. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He wants that sin to be taken away. If there's any immorality there, if there's any defilement there, if there's any abomination there, if there's any idol there, if there's any fraud there, he wants that to be taken away. And when you report it to the Lord, you say, Lord, I know I'm dirty. I know I'm sinful. I know I've not done the right thing. Help me. And you repent and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, it will take your sins away. Uh, look at that verse 5 again. And you know, and you know, you ought to know this, that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. He has not seen him walking the miracle of conversion, miracle of salvation, and miracle of transformation, because he has not taken the stone away. Then it says, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin, tell me, See, he has not taken away the stone. He, is not, he has not prepared for the glory of God, for the manifestation of the power of God to be manifested in his life. He's still living in sin, still living in evil. And because he's living in that evil, he does not allow the power of God to work in his life. And the Lord is waiting for you tonight. If there's any defilement there, the Lord is waiting for you tonight. If there is any abomination there, you will turn away from that. You will totally throw it away from, throw it away from your life. And when you do that, the power of Satan will be broken in your life. 
he'll release you, he'll take you out of the hand of Satan. Look at that verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil seen it from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. This is wonderful. Somebody shout wonderful. He, he was manifested so that he might tell me. I can't hear my people. That he might destroy the works of the devil. Every abomination, every work of the devil in your life tonight, the Lord will destroy in Jesus' name. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. Hey, let's come back to John. We're looking at John now, and we're reading from chapter 11. John chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 41 to verse 42. John, John. Chapter 11, verse 41. It says, Then they took away the stone. Then they took away the stone. Will you take all the sins away? I said, Will you take all the sins away? You're not allowing any little thing to remain. Because that's the path to the blessing. Instead of saying, It's thinking right now. It's been dead for days. And nobody has ever been raised up anybody like this that have been there for days. They didn't argue anymore. Thank God you'll not argue. They didn't doubt anymore. Thank God you'll not doubt. They surrendered their will. They surrendered their opinions. They surrendered everything to the Lord. And it says, and they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. Jesus and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. I thank thee that thou hast heard me. He prayed with confidence. He spoke to that grave with confidence. He, he raised up Lazarus because he came with the confidence of the very Son of God. It says in verse 42, And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. You understand that Jesus Christ was always, always responded to by the Father. Chapter 9 of John. John chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 31. John chapter 9, verse 31. Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshipper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Did Jesus do the will of the Father? I said, did Jesus do the will of the Father? How often did he do the will of the Father? Always, because he did the will of the Father always, the Father heard him always. The Father responded to his prayer always. The Father said yes to everything Jesus demanded always. Look at uh, the next verse there in verse 32. In verse 32, since the world began, it was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind. He did what no other person can do because the Father was always with him. Look at uh, chapter 17 of John. John, chapter 17. It is very important now. John, chapter 17, verse 8 and verse 9. John 17, verse 8 and 9. For I have given them thy words, which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Look at this. I pray for them. I was praying for some disciples. And remember, the Father always heard him. The Father always answered him. Look at verse 17. Sanctify them. 
through thy truth, thy word is truth. That's the prayer of Jesus for the church. And the Father always hears Jesus. Look at verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. That is, he prayed for the believers that will come after those early disciples. And the Father always answers the prayer of Jesus. He has prayed for your sanctification. I said he prayed for your sanctification. And if you will agree with that prayer, and you go to Calvary, you go to the cross, and you consecrate everything, and you lay everything down before the Lord, that prayer for you, sanctification, it will answer in Jesus' name. You'll be sanctified. I said you'll be sanctified. You'll be made holy. You'll be made pure. And that sanctification that Jesus prayed for will be visible in your heart, in your spirit, in your life, in Jesus' name. Did the church say amen? amen. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 7, we're looking at verse 25. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Wherefore, he is able. Somebody say he is able. He is able. able to say. He is able to heal. He is able to deliver. He is able to destroy the works of the devil. He is able to sanctify. He is able to empower you. He is able to solve all your problems. Did you say amen? amen? Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Look at this. Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He's praying for you. Now he's in heaven. When he was here on earth, he prayed and he said, Father, I know that you always hear me. But now he's gone to heaven and over there already he went with his blood. Because he already sacrificed himself and that sacrifice has been accepted by the Father. And now he's making intercession for you that you will not fail and you will not fail. He's making intercession for you that you will not fall and you will not fall. He's making intercession for you that your journey will not end halfway and your journey will not end halfway in Jesus' name. Verse 26, for such a night priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens. We're coming back to John chapter 11. Look at John chapter 11. And here I'm reading from verse 43 now, John chapter 11, and we're reading from verse 43. After Jesus had said what he said, after Jesus has affirmed, asserted the conviction that God answered his prayer every time. Now he's going to make a decree. Now he's going to make a declaration. And the decree made here, he can do something like that in your life. I said he can do something like this in your life. Yeah. Everything that is dead in your life will wake up tonight. Yeah. The brain that is dead will come alive. Yeah. The mind, the heart that is dead will come alive. Yeah. That, um, you know, child is like they said, the brain, there's no brain there. That thing will come alive in Jesus' name. Yeah. Your family will come alive. Yeah. The work of your hand will come alive. Yeah. Because once Jesus makes the declaration and he says, what's the name? No, no, no. I say, what's the name? I mean, your own name. What's your name? When he mentions and says, come forth, success has come in your life. And all the things that bothered you before that you thought, how will this happen? How will that happen? Thank God, I'm looking at a conqueror there. I'm looking at an overcomer there. Everything will come alive in Jesus' name. John chapter 11, and I'm reading here from verse 43. Look at verse 43. It says, And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead, not another person, that same person, that same person, and somebody there in front of me today, you as you are there, the miracle is coming not to another person, it's coming to you in Jesus' name. And then it says, and he that was dead came forth, bound, hand and foot, with great clothes, 
and his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus said unto them, Lose him, let him go. Every bondage you brought to the church, the Lord has told us ministers, Lose him, let him go. Every incurable disease you brought, the Lord has commanded us. He's given us the anointing that breaks the yoke. And he has said, I said, he has said, you're free. I'm looking at the free person there. You're free in Jesus' name. Lose him, let him go. You know, before I pass over that, one day is coming that Jesus will say this, not just to Lazarus, he'll say to all believers who have died in their grave. In a twinkling of an eye, in a moment, the voice will come from heaven, come forth, and the church will come forth. Yeah. There's going to be a resurrection, and then we which are alive, we're going to be changed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 51, the day is coming very soon. I will be part of this. I said I will be part of this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, in the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Are you part of that? And we shall be changed. First Thessalonians chapter 4. We're reading from verse 13. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe, any believer there tonight? For we, if we believe that Christ died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Look at this, verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, the Lord is coming. We shall not precede, present, uh, prevent or hinder them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then, then, those who are rapturable, then, those who are saved, then, those who are sanctified, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Will you be there? Thank God you'll be there. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. You see there, the Lord is mighty and powerful, majestic and glorious. And once he says, come forth, you're coming forth tonight in Jesus' name. And let's come back to John, point number two now. John chapter 11. The persuasion John chapter 11, we're looking at verse 45. You see, when Jesus called Lazarus and he came out of the grave, he told those people something, that Jesus is the Lord of glory. 
is a lot of power that with Jesus Christ, all things are possible. Think about this yourself. If Jesus will come to that place and Lazarus had been there for four days and he was taken already and Jesus just spoke the word without touching anything, without pulling anything, without pushing anything, without sprinkling, sprinkling a, you know, candle or whatever or incense or holy water. He just spoke the word, the word of power, the word of authority. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. If you were there, you will be saying, if he could do that to Lazarus, I know he can solve my problem. If he could do that, I trust him. If he could do that, I'm going to give my life. I'm going to give everything I have unto him because I know he's going to manifest that power in my life. Because they were now persuaded. Somebody there tonight, you are persuaded. I said you are persuaded. That's why I come back, come to John chapter 11. And we're looking at verse 45. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. They saw and they were persuaded. They saw and they were convinced. They saw and they said there's no other person that can do this. There's no other savior. This is the only savior. The one that can raise the dead, he can raise those who are dead in, in sins and trespasses. And their lives will turn around. The persuasion came on them. And look at chapter 10 of John. John chapter 10, we're reading from verse 14. And went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John had first baptized and there he abode, look at verse 41, and many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true. That's what gave them confidence. That's what gave them persuasion. And that's why now they were going to believe, look at verse 42, and many believed on him. With what Jesus Christ has done, I'm sure you believe. I said, I'm sure you believe. Come back to that same John chapter 11. And let's look at that verse, verse 45 again. John 11, that verse 45 again, it says, Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. Believed on him. That's the effect of the miracle. And when you see a miracle, that should be the effect in your life. When you see somebody who had been sick for such a long time, and then the word of God comes forth, and through the name of Jesus Christ, that person is healed, that should make you say, I'm going to believe you. Because if the Lord could do that, if the Lord could do the impossible, the incredible, something that had never been done in another person's life, I can trust my life, I can trust my heart, I can trust my present, I can trust my future into his hand. And that's uh, what the Lord wants you to do today. I'm sure you are going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You believe before, you are going to believe him again for more in your life in Jesus' name. Let's look at uh, chapter 4 of John. John chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 39. The result of seeing what Christ has done, the miracle Christ has performed, the glory of Christ that shone forth, the result of that in the lives of these people. John chapter 4, verse 39. And many of the Samaritans, of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman who testified he told me all that ever I did they said nobody could have done that except Jesus except the Savior except the Messiah he told you everything you ever did and was meeting you for the first time because of that they were convinced and then they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ look at chapter 8 chapter 8 of John many believed Thank God I'm one of the many that have believed. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I said I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's my Savior. He's my Lord. He's my healer. He's my redeemer. Because of what he has done in other people's lives and in my life, I must keep on believing. And as you keep on believing, miracles will keep on happening in your life in Jesus' name. 
John chapter 8, we're looking at verse 30. John chapter 8, verse 30. As he spake these words, many believed on him. You see, you will be like an exception. If you don't believe, it will be like, you know, maybe the devil has totally put you inside a bag and then he's put you in a dungeon and he blinded your eyes and he, he, he was stopped, he stopped your ears and then you cannot even think at all. Look at all these people in this chapter, they all believe. Many believed on him. In that other chapter, many believed on him. Now it is your turn. Thank God you believe. I say, thank God you believe. Verse 30, as he speak these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And then it says, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth will make you free. Every bondage taken away in your life. John chapter 12, verse 11. John chapter 12, verse 11. We're following through with the thought that when they saw, they were convinced, they were persuaded, and they believed. John chapter 12, verse 11. Because by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. That's the normal consequence. That's the natural consequence. Because they were fully persuaded, so they went and they believed. Thank God I am persuaded. If you are persuaded, you say it better than that. In Romans, thank God you are persuaded. The Lord will fulfill it in your life in Jesus' name. In Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 4, verse 21. Romans chapter 4, verse 21. Be fully persuaded. You see that? Not only partially, uh, partially uh, uh, persuaded and not half-heartedly persuaded. It says be fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. He staggered not at the promise of God. Even when Christ said, even though he had been there for days, I'm going to raise him up because of the resurrection and the life. He got there and it happened. And he's here tonight and it is going to happen. I said it's here tonight is going to happen. Look at verse 22. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. That is when he believed like that. The Lord gave that account that is that his righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone. That it was imputed to him but for us also. To whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. And because he's done that for us, we're going to receive in Jesus' name. Uh, let's come back. Let's come back to this John chapter 11. Let's see some other people. This was the arch another heart. The arch another mind. They had a problem. Look at them. John chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 46. From verse 46. And some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. The Pharisees at this time were not there. Normally they, they'll, they'll be in places like this, anywhere Jesus was. But because uh, what had happened here is that Mary and Martha were bereaved. And these people came to sympathize with them. Because of Lazarus who had died. And they were there and they saw the miracle happen. When Jesus said, Lazarus come forth, he came forth. They were so surprised. And they saw the Pharisees, they were not around. They should have seen this. They should know that this Jesus is the Lord of glory, is the Lord of life, is the resurrection and the life. They should know that this Jesus Christ can do all things. With men, this is impossible, but not with Jesus. It's like God. He can do everything. And so they went to tell the Pharisees. What was the attitude of the Pharisees? Look at this, verse 47. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council, a committee, 
and said, Who do we? For this man doeth many miracles. Nobody could deny those miracles. This man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Will take, they'll come and they'll take away both our place and our nation. You see what, you know what? They were about their place, protecting their place, protecting their position, protecting their religion. Their hearts were not right with God. They were hardened by religion. They were hardened by tradition. What brought joy to other people brought jealousy on them and in them. Have you noticed the people who are not saved, the people who are not born again, or the people who are backsliding, the people who are not living right? What brings joy to everybody brings jealousy in their own heart. And these Pharisees, instead of having joy, there was jealousy. What brought salvation to other people brought condemnation, damnation to them. Because now they said, this Jesus is working so many miracles, but that's good. They said, no, it's not good. Because if he continues like that, people will not recognize our position, religious position. They will not recognize our authority, religious authority. They will not respect our tradition. And it is better for Lazarus to remain in the grave than to come out of the grave than for our tradition to be forgotten. You see the kind of uh, heart they had. Others believe. In fact, it says many believe. But instead of believing, they were bitter. I pray you will not be like that. Their hearts were blinded. Their eyes were blinded. They became a barrier and barricade. Barring them from heaven, from eternal life, from everlasting life, and from eternal peace and rest. What did they think of doing uh, as a result of the miracle that Jesus Christ performed? Uh, look at this. This one is almost unbelievable. Look at John chapter 12. John chapter 12. I'm reading here from verse 9. John chapter 12 from verse 9. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. And they came, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. Look at verse 10. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. Think about that. They were so bitter. They were so angry. They couldn't see the goodness of the Lord or the glory of the Lord. They said this Lazarus that became an instrument in tool in the hand of the Lord for many to believe, we're going to kill him, we're going to put him to death. The jealousy was so much, the bitterness was so much, the hardness of heart was so much and their unrighteousness came to the fore, came to the front because now they were not willing to believe. Look at uh, verse, uh, look at verse uh, 10 there. But the chief uh, priest consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death because that by reason of him, uh, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. I pray your heart will not be like that. They were not entering the kingdom and they were not going happy for those who are entering into the kingdom. Uh, look at uh, Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 52. Thank God you are not like this. I'm not like this. I will not be like this. Whatever will make you to be like this, the Lord should take it away from your heart in Jesus' name. No bitterness in your heart. No jealousy in your heart. No hatred for the truth in your heart. You love the truth and you love the miracles of God. In Luke chapter 11 verse 52. Woe unto you lawyers. For ye, ha, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves. And them that were entering in ye hindered. You see because they were not there. Because they did not receive the miracle. Because Lazarus was not their relative. And they wanted to kill him. Because many people want to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They were not going to enter the kingdom of God. And the people that wanted to enter, they were hindering. 
you will not be a barrier to anyone. You will not hinder anyone. You will not stop anyone that wants to get into the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Religion will not blindfold you. Tradition will not deaden your heart. You will come alive in Jesus' name. We are coming to point three now. Well, this point three is the prophecy. The prophecy, the truth announced for all sinners. We are coming to chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 49. Look at verse 49. And one of them, one of those Pharisees who did not like what had happened, one of them, one of those religious people who wanted to protect religion, protect tradition, I would rather stay in darkness, spiritual darkness, one of them, and one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all. He didn't, he didn't tell them what he was saying himself. He said, Ye know nothing at all. In verse 50, Now consider that it is expedient for us, look at this, that one man should die for the people. He was prophesying, but he didn't know. Look at this prophecy, that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. Isn't that exactly what Jesus came to do? He was going to die for the people, so that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And Caiaphas did not know that was prophesying. Look at verse 51, and they speak he not of himself. But being the high priest that year, he prophesied. He prophesied. What did he do? Say it aloud. Let me hear you. Say it as if you believe. He prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. Look at verse 52. And not for that nation only but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that has scattered abroad. That means then he gave that prophecy without knowing that he gave the prophecy. But listen to this. He gave a great prophecy, a scriptural prophecy, a sound prophecy, a true prophecy. He gave an accurate prophecy that Jesus Christ will die a sacrifice for the people, for the nation, and for people beyond that nation. It was a sure prophecy. It was an authentic prophecy. It was a right prophecy. It was an essential prophecy. Because without that prophecy, without the death of Jesus Christ, nobody will be saved. And so Jesus was going to die. He was going to give his life so that the people who are in sin will be saved. Actually, it was a fundamental prophecy. Every other prophecy in the word of God was hanging on the prophecy of Jesus Christ going to the cross, going to Calvary, and going to die. It was a foundational prophecy. It's a prophecy that's a foundation to any other prophecy in the word of God. It was an affirmed prophecy. As we look at it from the Old Testament to the New Testament, it's a prophecy of God affirmed. It was a prophecy that was asserted everywhere in the Bible. But listen to this. Is he, the high priest, who made the prophecy, did not understand the prophecy and did not benefit from the prophecy. Very serious, very serious. That a person will make a great prophecy like that, a central prophecy like that, an essential prophecy like that, and yet he didn't have any benefit of that prophecy. You see, there are people who preach. And they may preach as something sure, something fundamental, something foundational, something essential, something authentic, something true. And yet, they are not beneficiaries of what they are preaching. They preach salvation, they, are not, they don't benefit in that salvation. They preach holiness, they don't benefit in that holiness. They preach healing, they don't benefit in that healing. They preach deliverance, they don't benefit in that deliverance. Like Caiaphas, who made the prophecy and yet did not benefit at all. I will be a partaker. I said I will be a partaker. 
Hey, hey, don't, be, don't be somebody running around and you know, you're speaking sound doctrine, you're giving sound doctrine, there, but you're not benefiting out of that sound doctrine. You talk about sanctification and you talk about a new heart and you talk about a new life and it is not like that in your life. You talk about a family, one man, one wife until death do us part, but you're not a beneficiary of that kind of a prophecy because you are not allowing Jesus Christ to do something in your heart. You know it, you, you seem to know where it is in the Bible but the benefit is not there today everything will change John chapter 18 I'm reading from verse 14 John chapter 18 look at verse 14 here now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people well Caiaphas, what you are saying is not something new. Jesus himself even said it. Jesus himself even said it. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Matthew chapter 20, and we're reading from verse 28. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, look at the prophecy here. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus said so. So, Caiaphas, you are not telling us anything new. In fact, we can go as far back as Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53. And see what Isaiah said. That this one man, the Christ, the Messiah, he was going to give his life for the salvation of many. So, what Caiaphas said, it was true. Although he himself was not a truthful person. In Isaiah chapter 53, I'm reading from verse, I'm reading from verse 4. Sure Surely he has borne our griefs. He will bear your griefs. And carry our sorrows. Carry all your sorrows away. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes. And with his stripes. We are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And we are coming to the New Testament. We are looking at Romans chapter 5 verse 6. Romans chapter 5 and we are reading from verse 6. You see that this prophecy of Caiaphas is something that you know the Bible knows knows about but it was strange for Caiaphas to have prophesied like that and not to have any benefit of it everything you are hearing tonight you'll be a beneficiary you'll be a partaker in Jesus name uh, look at uh, Romans chapter 5 verse 6. Romans chapter 5 uh, verse 6. It's saying, for when we were yet without strength in due time, what happened? Christ died for the ungodly. That's what Caiaphas was saying, that Jesus was going to die. He was going to die for the people. Look at this, verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, tell me, Christ died for us. That's what Christ has done. He has died for you. I said he has died for you. You'll be a beneficiary. You'll be a partaker. Caiaphas could not partake of it. Caiaphas could not taste of that salvation. But thank God, salvation is available for everyone here today. It will cleanse your heart. It will change your life. It will give you eternal life. And the death has died for you. You are not going to die that death anymore. It takes the punishment of sin away from you. And it sets you free. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 14. Ephesians chapter 2. Reading from verse 14. It says, For he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make 
to, for to make in himself, he makes in himself a one in himself of twin, one new man. So making peace. And then he says, and he has uh, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. He has slain the enmity thereby. Everything that stood between you and God, Jesus Christ died, he removed everything. Now, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I said, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be sanctified. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. His salvation is available today. His deliverance is available today. His sanctification, his holiness, his very nature is available today. He'll do it for everyone that calls upon him in Jesus' name. First Peter chapter 2 verse 24. First Peter chapter 2. We're reading from verse 24. See what Christ has done. It says, who is own self. Here's what Carpus was saying. It is expedient that one should die for the sins of the whole nation. That one should die and the people will not perish. Who is who is own self. Be our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness. By whose stripes ye were healed. Christ has done it. And you'll be a partaker in Jesus' name. Chapter 3 of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also has once suffered for sins. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Quickened by the Spirit. We're coming back to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Now we read from verse 54. See what happened to these people. Because of their conspiracy and because of their unbelief, they drove Jesus away from them. You will not drive Jesus away from you. The Prince of Life, the Lord of Glory, and the God of Majesty, they drove him away from their midst. Look at it from verse 54. And Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but he went thence unto a country near to the wilderness into a city called Ephraim. And there continued with his disciples. But you know what? Everywhere he went, his disciples followed him. They said, we're not going to leave you, and you will not leave Christ. I said, you will not leave Christ. Caiaphas might be negative, you are not going to be negative. The Jews might be plotting, having a conspiracy, you are not going to join their conspiracy in Jesus' name. He led them, but the good thing and the beautiful thing is that the disciples continued with him. I will continue. I said I will continue. Caiaphas will not intimidate you. The Pharisees will not intimidate you. The opposers will not intimidate you. Where Jesus is, there is where you will be. If you are with him here on earth, you can tell when you leave this world, you'll be with him in, forever in Jesus' name. Uh, look at Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. We're reading from verse 28. Luke chapter 22. And we're reading from verse 28. It tells us here in verse 28, they continued with him. They continued. What a beautiful thing. What a wonderful thing that as you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and then tires will come, temptation will come, difficulties will come, Caiaphas will be opposed to, you know, what decision you have taken, religious people are going to be opposed to what you have done, but you say, I will still continue. I said, I will still continue. Ah, my people are tired now. You will continue in Jesus' name. In Luke chapter 22, verse 28, it says, Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations, in my trials, in my opposition. When the Jews did not believe, you, my disciples, who have continued with me. Verse 29, And I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father has appointed me, that 
ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on the thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Thank God I will be there. First John chapter 2. Continue. Continue. First John chapter 2. We're reading from verse 24. In First John chapter 2, verse 24, the, the secret of being with God in heaven, Christ in heaven, is that you continue to the very end and you do not allow any sin, any temptation, any trial, any sin to dissuade you and turn you back. First John chapter 2, verse 24, Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning, if that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. You will continue. I will continue. We shall all continue in Jesus' name. We're coming back now to John chapter 11. In John chapter 11, we're reading the last uh, few verses there now from verse 55, John chapter 11. We're reading from verse 55. It says that the Jews' Passover was near at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. And they sought, and then sought they for Jesus. They sought day for Jesus. Then you're asking yourself, but some of you are not believing. Some of you are following Pharisees. Some of you are following the Sadducees. Why is it you are seeking for Jesus? There was not, some of them were not seeking for the right reason, but I will seek the Lord aright. I said I will seek the Lord aright. They sought for Jesus and they spake among themselves as they stood in the temple. What think ye? that ye will not come to the feast. Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew, knew where he were, he should show it that they might take him. Those who are unbelievers, and because they were unbelievers, that's why they said what they said, and they did what they did. But thank God we are here not to oppose Jesus. Am I right? Not to criticize Jesus, am I right? Yes. We're here to believe. I say we're here to believe. Yes. I am here to believe. Yes. I am here to receive. Yes. And what Jesus did for Lazarus is no respecter of persons. He will do for you tonight. Yes. You will see the glory of God in your life, in your heart, in your soul, in your spirit, in your business. Anything around your life, you'll see his glory in Jesus' name. Are you ready to see that glory? Now you must remember the preparation. Take here away the stone. Take here away the stone. And the Bible says, and they took away the stone. And once they took away the stone, and you took, take away the abomination, take away whatever it is in your life that God is not happy with, then Christ is going to come to you right there, even tonight, and is going to say, mention your name now, Lazarus, come forth. You are coming forth. Into salvation you are coming forth. Into life eternal you are coming forth. Into power you are coming forth. Into healing you are coming forth. Into deliverance you are coming forth. Into success you are coming forth. Into the light you are coming forth. And then all the great clothes and the things that bind you, all the curse and all the yoke, everything is going to be broken. Because the Lord has commanded, has told me tonight, Lose him and let him go. Lose her and let her go. You are ready to receive. I said you are ready to receive. Where are you now? You are ready to receive. You tell the Lord, oh Lord, I come. Oh Lord, I come. Take away that stone. Take away that stone. Take away that stone. Say, Lord, I come. Lord, I come. Take away the stone right there. Any defilement, any sin, any sin, take everything away. Take everything away. Take everything away and say, Lord, I come. Lord, I come. 
Take that thing away right there. Take that thing away right there. Any abomination there? Any secret sin there? Take it away. Take it away. Confess it to the Lord. Repent of it and say, Lord, here I come. Abomination, I take that away. Defilement, I take that away. All the anger, I take that away. All the criticism, I take that away. All the evil, I take that away. I'm not going to allow any sin to block my way. I'm not going to allow any tradition to block my way. I'm not going to allow any religion to block my way. Take it away. Take it away. Take it away. And as you take it away, the Lord is going to speak power into your life tonight. It's going to speak authority into your life tonight. It's going to speak salvation, salvation, salvation into your life tonight. You'll never forget today. You'll never forget today. The day you came out of your spiritual death and you came into life, eternal life, spiritual life, abundant life, heavenly life. You're coming into that life tonight. Take that stone away. Take that sin away. Take that magic away. Take that occultism away. And take all the lies away. Everything that is blocking the glory of God in your life. Take it away. Take it away. Take it away. Take it away. And say, Lord, now I'm ready. Now I'm ready. Let him speak salvation, forgiveness, redemption. It's your life right there. He'll take your guilt away. He'll take your condemnation away. He will take the stony heart away out of your heart right there. Is there, is there, is there, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And if you can just, if you will just take that stone away, you will see the glory of God. On your wife, you'll see the glory of God. On your husband, you'll see the glory of God. In your family, you'll see the glory of God. In the work of your hand, you'll see the glory of God. In your body, in your body, that part of the body that is dead will come alive. It will come alive because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as he spoke at that time, is he speaking today? As he commanded at that time, is he commanding today? As he decreed at that time, he's still decreeing today. Life is coming. Life is coming to you. Life is coming to you. Power is coming to you. Authority is coming to you. There is anointing here tonight that breaks every yoke. There's anointing here tonight that raises the dead. There's anointing here tonight that heals the sick. There's anointing here tonight that takes all your yokes away. There's anointing here tonight that is going to solve your problem. And then it says, lose him, let him go. Lose him and let him go. Lose him and let him go. It's happening to you. It's happening to you. It's happening to you. It's happening to you. You cannot escape that miracle power tonight. You cannot escape that decree tonight. You cannot escape the solution of your problem tonight. It's doing it right now. It's doing it right now. It's standing by your graveside. It's standing by the mouth of that cave where you are. It's standing by that dungeon where you are. And it's going to speak now. It's going to speak now. It's going to mention your name. And it's going to call you to come forth. It's going to make the power of God to come into your life and to blow everything that is negative away from your life. And it's going to set you free tonight. Free tonight. Free tonight. Free tonight. Free tonight from the top of your head to the tip of your toe. You are going to be free. In your soul, you are going to be free. In your spirit, you are going to be free. He will set you free. All the chains, they snap everything. All the bondage, they will shatter, destroy everything. Set you free. Set you free. Set you free. That's why you came tonight. That's why you came tonight. That's why you came tonight. Because resurrection power is here. Supernatural power is here. And it says, lose him, let him go. Give your life to the Lord. Just hand over everything to the Lord. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. And not be like Caiaphas. Lord, I believe. And not be a Pharisee. Lord, I believe. And not be an onlooker. Lord, I believe. I'll not be a spectator. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. I believe the Lord tonight. Hand over your sins unto him. He has died for you. 
to take all your sins away and now you're free now you're free now you're free he has blotted all the transgressions away all the guilt he has taken away every evil thing he has taken away and he has set you free he has set you free tell him tell him tell him i'm free tell him i'm free lord i believe lord i believe and many believed on him there and many believed on him there and many believed on him there and as many as believe tonight you receive eternal life you receive forgiveness of sin you receive redemption you receive total freedom and you receive the salvation of the lord lord i believe he died for me i believe he took my sins away i believe he took my guilt away i believe he took all my sorrows away i believe and he's taking the curse away he's taking the yoke away lord i believe lord i believe lord i believe it happens immediately the peace of god will come to your heart the joy of salvation will come to your life a new life will come eternal life will come abundant life will come the supernatural power of the lord will transfer the very life and the very victory of jesus into your soul into your spirit i believe i believe lord i believe and from tonight things that are negative all your condemnation is taken away all the pollution of your sin is taken away all the guilt is taken away damnation is taken away and it sets you free it sets you free it sets you free receive it it's done receive it it's done once jesus said so the father confirms it heaven confirms it and the promise is fulfilled in your life In Jesus' name we pray. And let the believers in the church tonight say, Amen. Let's bow the eyes closed. Let's bow the eyes closed. You know, Jesus Christ died for everyone. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you know, Caiaphas made a true prophecy. And it was authentic, it was true, it was sound, it was scriptural that Jesus Christ will die for many people. And he died for you. Your name can enter into the book of life right here tonight. And if there's any sin that has bogged you down, any sin that is defeating your life, any sin that is giving you guilt, giving you condemnation, and you know that if you die in that condition, you cannot get to heaven because no sin will get to heaven with any of us. But forgiveness is available here tonight. Forgiveness available here tonight. Anywhere you are, anywhere you are in any location, anywhere you are in any church location, in any state, in any region, anywhere you are now, you want that forgiveness. So I say, Yes, Lord, I'm here. Give me that forgiveness. Just raise up your hand. Immediately that salvation will come. Immediately that freedom will come. Where are you? Where are you? Raise up that hand. Father, in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, because whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. All these people here and over there and everywhere that believe you tonight and accept your salvation, grant them your forgiveness, grant them your salvation in Jesus' name. Let darkness vanish away. Let oppression vanish away. Let their condemnation vanish away. Give them the freedom, that redemption, that salvation, that conversion right now in Jesus' name. Let your spirit bear witness in their hearts. They are now children of God. Their names are written in the book of life in heaven. It is done. It is done. It is done. Confirm it in their hearts and their lives in Jesus' name. And somebody said, now any yoke there tonight is the end of that yoke the termination of that sickness and the terminal end of that oppression 
and all that thing you, you know they put any kind of um, you stone there and they are forgotten it's like that thing is incurable take away that stone tonight is the stone of unbelief take that away and let life come let life penetrate into that place where you are healing in the dungeon healing has come tonight deliverance has come tonight freedom has come tonight every curse is taken away tonight in jesus name what are you there you need a miracle what are you there you need a miracle father in jesus name we thank you because you are mightily present here. And the name that cannot fail. The name that will enter into every grave and bring out everyone that is bound inside there. That name of Jesus is here tonight. In the name of Jesus, I speak to every one of you. Sickness, be healed in Jesus' name. Whatever it is, you, you know, you brought a sickness. The doctor said, the doctor said that, I cancel it right now. Receive your healing in Jesus' name. Deliverance has come. Every yoke in your life is broken in Jesus' name. The anointing that breaks the yoke cannot fail. And therefore, Lord, I pray, every yoke, every oppression, every cause, I remove it from their lives now in Jesus' name. The healing of the Lord upon your body upon your wife, upon your husband, upon your children, upon your parents. Receive, receive, receive. You are free in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray, those who are battling with failure, those who are battling with curse, those who are battling with whatever the devil has put in their lives, I remove that thing by your power. And I pray that every evil sinner, the, the, the heavenly father, has not parted in your life. That thing be uprooted in Jesus' name. Set everyone free. Set everyone free. Lose them and let them go. And I pray, Lord, that you make your blessings to flow into every life tonight. And I pray that as we go, everyone, you go with a miracle. You go with your healing. You go with your deliverance and you go with your freedom in Jesus' name. It is done. I said it is done. I receive. I said I receive. What are you there? It is unto you according to the pronouncement of the prophecy in Jesus' name. Thank you and God bless you.